Hello and welcome to In Search of Purpose with Sal Hamby. Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm Sal Hamby and I have the great pleasure of introducing John McCormick from Helen's Bay Organic Farm. How are you there? Hello, Sal. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, you too. Thanks for coming on, John. Uh, John, just so people can have a bit of an idea of, of, of where, where you grew up and your background and stuff, let's start with that. Well, um, I come originally from Dublin. I lived there until I was 21. And um, I wasn't from a farming background. I lived in an urban situation and I'm an urban schoolboy and um, went on to become a banker. Um, but very quickly realized I didn't want to do that. And so then I experimented with lots of different things from oil rigs to nightclubs and a few things in between until I eventually decided upon um, wanting to go and study again. So I studied sciences, which led me to horticultural science, which led me to actually discovering what I really wanted to do was to grow vegetables. And I've been doing this since I've been since I was 28. And I'm now 68, so 40 years. <laughs> 40 years doing years. vegetables and growing, that's amazing. Um, I mean, I before I ever met you, um, I used to buy your vegetables down at St. George's Market on a Saturday morning and loved the fact that um, there was knobbly bits on the carrots and that, you know, it, it was just, it wasn't about the aesthetically pleasing notion in the supermarkets of how things should look, but how things should taste. And you know the big emphasis to me is always on taste and nutri- nutrition of the foods rather than how you know orange the carrot has to be or how perfectly round the apple has to be or whatever. So that's what attracted me to your stall in St George's Market all those years ago. And you know it took a good few years for me to have a conversation with you. It wasn't until I was um, writing an article for Northern Woman magazine when I was a freelance journalist for them and um, I contacted you, but it literally was for a good few years that I wanted to get in touch with you about the things that you did because I just loved the fact that you did deliveries. I loved the fact that it was in County Down. I loved the fact that it had been running for so many years and I loved the fact that you had a stall in the market on a Saturday morning. So, and it was organic. Obviously, that's the big the big draw. Uh, so for me, that's that's what led me into um, writing an article about the farm and about the goings on at the farm and things like that. And um, before we get good into that, um, you know, obviously, forty years it's a passion of yours. You know, organic organic veg growing obviously was was is it, you know considering you've done so many other various dynamic things like banking and. You know, you were in America for a while as well, weren't you? That's right, yeah. Uh-huh. And what were you, were you over there doing? Uh, th- that's where I was doing, um, working in a restaurant and a nightclub. Okay, okay. And where about in America was that? That was in New York City. Wow. Right in the middle of Times Square. Wow. And, um, yeah, it was quite some fun. I was in my early 20s and... Yeah, New York with, uh, back in, well, my early 20s would have been one, the early 70s. So quite a crazy place, you know, quite a crazy place back then. Um, I was very lucky. I never met the violent side of New York, which was very prevalent then. But I did meet the crazy side of New, of New York and um, uh, went to a lot of clubs and, you know, especially music clubs, which were fantastic. I mean, you could just hear such wonderful music. Um, I, I, I was a bit too young, though. I, 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 you know, th- I, when you're older, you look back and you think, oh, why didn't I do that? And why didn't I do that? You know, I, I wish I had explored the art of New York, for instance. You know, mm-hmm. the, so much, you know, so many art galleries and I never got a chance to. I was, well, it wasn't my interest then, you know, music was my interest and having fun was my interest, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. And so it should be. And um, what was the best concert that you uh, went to in America? Music? I, I, to be honest with you, names elude me. I didn't go to any of the big names. I just went to, um, to mostly it was folk uh, singers. Um, uh, and uh, obviously Bob Dylan was a big name by then. And there were an awful lot of people singing um, both John Baez and Bob Dylan songs in small clubs and singing their own music. And I was just kind of very homely and... 
um, refreshing and yeah, nice people. And and um, and that was the thing that always struck me about about America is just how uh, how friendly people were. People were incredibly friendly. I ne I never met the underbelly. I always seemed to be. I was always very lucky. And uh, and and when I look back on it now, it was a great experience. Truly great experience. Well, exactly. I've been to New York every decade. I was there in the 80s, the 90s, the noughties, and the teenies. So it's now the 20s. And I don't think I'll be getting any time soon, but I hope that in the next 10 years I'll be able to get at some point. But I don't know. I think the older I get, the less, the less I like New York. I want to kind of, you know, because I, I used to always think I was a real jet-setting uh, cosmo sort of the person in cities. But I, I realise the older I get, the the far I'm as far from that as anything and you know I'm a total kind of not country bumpkin but I definitely appreciate sea air and space and you know your farm Helen's Bay Organic Farm it's it's a far cry from Times Square Manhattan and well, it, is, it is a huge huge difference and to be honest with you, you know many people ask me you know do you not want to travel and see the world I've seen a lot of the world and um, but and my answer nowadays is actually there's so much in the bottom of my pond to explore that I don't need to explore anywhere else. I'm more than happy just to stay where I am. Well, isn't that lovely? That's a lovely um, sentiment, especially for now where you know it's it's more difficult to get about um, under the current situation with regards to the COVID nineteen coronavirus. So I suppose in a way um, now is the time to be feeling a bit more settled rather than oh no I had to cancel my two week package holiday in June. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean this coronavirus is very challenging, there's no doubt whatsoever. Um and and I feel really sorry for so many people who aren't as privileged as I am. I mean I I I don't live on my farm but I live close to my farm. I can commute to my farm quite safely. And um and I can nothing really much has changed for me because I'm on the farm all day. Uh, the only the only big changes I notice my staff we we do all have to s be very strict about social isolation you know we stay six feet, six feet or eight feet apart and I'm I'm the old vulnerable one at this stage of course you know so I do find that I'm when when a member of staff is coming around the corner and spots me they run the opposite direction <laughs> 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 very wide but I'm walking around a bit like a leper in the place you know and in a way, my life, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I has settled down so much that I, I don't really have much interest in um, in going places or doing things because um, I have more than enough interest work in my working life. And um, uh, and uh, and when I come home, you know, I, um, I, I I sit and have meals with my wife and we play games in the evening sometimes or just read books or just do our own thing. She's an artist and she's always busy doing something or other. Yeah. So, uh, so our lives are very quiet anyway, and we, we, I, I think we produce much nicer meals at home than I ever would in a restaurant anyway. <laughs> well, that's it. And on a lot of the podcasts, I'm actually asking people, um, you know, when things sort of, you know, turn into some, some form of normality and, and we, you know, we get a chance to eat out again, you know, where is it that they're looking forward to eating? But it was one of the questions I wasn't even particularly going to ask you because I thought, well, you know, this man knows how to cook this man knows how to survive well and eat well and a lot of restaurants are probably disappointed john wouldn't they well i think they do a very good job and um i i, I will not pretend that i can cook as well as many most of the restaurants in belfast you know these are very experienced chefs but um my t my 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 needs and my tastes are quite simple mm -hmm. um and and they were most of my cooking was hugely influenced by a trip i uh, my wife and i made to india about well, it must be what this is 2020, so um, eight years ago, okay. and we spent, we spent three months there, you know, touring around and and eating extremely well. Um, uh, food in India is just truly spectacular, and um, and and it's uh, and so I, I'm more than happy just to eat simply spiced vegetables and dal and rice and my own potatoes and sometimes you know make a pancake for a pudding you know with nice stewed apple and a bit of vegan cream um so yeah um i i think uh, I, I think eating out really for me is overrated i understand why lots of other people do it but for me and especially because i can go out every day i, I at about three o'clock i start thinking what am i going to eat tonight <laughs> and i'm able to then walk out and pick what i want to eat you know 
that's just it's fantastic to be able to do that Absolutely. And, you know, I think that, you know, the, the joy in being able to, to do that and having it on your doorstep and knowing that all the nutrients are just living and then you're eating them there and then, I mean, you're never going to get better than that. Nobody. And then it's not even just vegetables, it's organic vegetables, which obviously is a completely different ball game altogether. So for anyone who's watching or listening today, John, um, who maybe has a perception of organic versus non-organic and is a bit confused to know and to be able to differentiate between you know the marketing side of what they say and what the reality is of what it is you're the man to really you know set aside exactly what it is between the two and um, that's important could you explain a bit about that i can yes i think what happened in agriculture over the last 50 years has been a real focus on um, the science of agriculture. But it, it was unfortunately a bit blinkered because it concentrated on the chemistry of, of, um, of both how plants grow and plant pathology and, um, and how one can assist those things. Uh, and so the development of chemical fertilizers and herbicides to kill off the weeds and, and and pesticides to kill off the pests um, became dominant and prevalent. And nobody really started to pay any attention to biology. Now science has, you know, physics, chemistry and biology are the three, you know, cornerstones and bedrock of what science is about. And the, the biology got left completely behind. Mm -hmm. and with, the, with, the, with the consequence that we're seeing today, we're seeing, you know, mass biodiverse extinction all around us. We're seeing soils um, slowly dying basically and the, the only reason plants live in them is because they're being fed with chemical fertilizers uh, and, 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 and even then with, because they're being fed with these chemical fertilizers they, they don't have the vigor and they don't have the, the, the resistance against the pests so they have to be sprayed in order to be able to survive and get a yield out of them. So I realized many 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 years ago um, uh, that, that I wasn't going to go that road. I, 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 knew, I knew about the organic, the organic path. It, it wasn't standardized in those days. Mm -hmm. Shortly after, uh, by, I think it was around the 1980s, it started to get standardized and standards came in. And then the European legal standard came in in the 1990s. And essentially what organic farmers are doing is um, of course we work with, with, with chemistry. We want to know, you know what our NPK, you know, nitrogen, potassium and phosphates, the three primary um, uh, feeding things in the soil, uh, what, what, what levels we have there. We also want to know what our trace elements are like because trace elements are so important. Um, but we want to know more than that. Uh, we're not going to depend entirely on, on purely chemistry. We're going, to, uh, we're going to create the chemistry through biology. And so we create living soils and living soils. Th there is a, a myriad of things living at different levels within the soil. And you have things from um, uh, bacteria and protozoa and nematodes, and they all live within the soil. And then near the surface, you've got um, all the other little wriggly things that run around in the top of the soil. Um, and, uh, from, and then you've got the earthworms and you've got numerous types of earthworms but they're basically three types you've got um it sounds a bit like lord of the rings you've got the <laughs> the, the earth earth um uh, earthworms and you've got the mid earth <laughs> earthworms and you've got the the earthworms that live in the top you know in the top within the top one inch or so you know and they live a little lot on the surface and uh, and you've got all those as well so essentially and and they all feed off each other and in their eating and living and dying and excreting and living and all the, the symbiotic relationships and then there's fungi in there mixed in among them as well. So if you can get all these things working well together symbiotically, they will generate through their life cycle fertility for your plants to be able to grow healthily. Well, that's a really good analogy. And so what you have to do, what you have to do is to feed them. So when we think in terms of putting compost onto the soil, we think in terms of not compost to grow plants, it's compost to feed the myriad things in the soil that in turn will feed our plants mm -hmm. and, then, and make a more resilient and healthier plant. 
and in a nutshell that's what organic farming is about well it's fantastic i mean the part that struck a chord with me there is the the mineral electrolyte deficiency and depletion in the soil um one question would be about the chromium chromium is is a problem uh, in soil these days in the sense that our, we're deficient in chromium um, quite a lot uh, because of the, the processes that a lot of farms take in order to grow the crop. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but if you've got a chromium deficiency in the soil or in the person as a result of not getting it through the nourished food, uh, chromium it can be responsible for um, making your blood sugar very uh, unstable. And there is a sugar epidemic in the world in the sense that people crave so much sugar. And it's that kind of thing where as a nutritional advisor myself, I know that when people say that they're craving chocolate, they really a lot of the time have a magnesium deficiency. And if they're craving crisps, they usually would have a sodium deficiency or at least an electrolyte imbalance between sodium and potassium. So a lot of people who crave sugar I would often find that they have chromium deficiency and I would often get them to get a mineral analysis done with their doctor or something in order to determine that. And chromium is forgotten about, you know, people know about calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, but they don't really know enough about chromium. And I mean, I'm sure that your soil has all the trace minerals that are necessary for good growth. We do. Um, I mean, I haven't had my soil tested for a couple of years, but I've seen the testing in this coming year, simply because it's been a while since I've done it. But we've always had the full spectrum. Um, the only one that we seemed for a while to be deficient in was boron. Uh, and a new, just in, new, in a new field, Northern Ireland soils are quite deficient in boron. But, um, uh, through, through good feeding the soil with good compost, um, you, you can create it. I remember a story, I remember reading once something to give you an idea um, uh, uh, about slugs when it was, it was in a book I was reading uh, lectures by Rudolf Steiner and he was talking about um, microbes and living things in the soil and the importance of a living soil and he also said you know everything has its place including slugs because nobody likes slugs. <laughs> no. And, um, everybody wants to get rid of the slugs but he pointed out that um, the, the slime, you know, the little silver s slime that's left behind when a slug passes across the ground. Yeah. That's very, very rich in various minerals that in turn are incredibly important for the life in the soil. And so you realize that everything has its purpose, including the slugs. <laughs> And so I, I've always looked upon slugs more benevolently since I read that, which was quite some years ago. I still don't want them eating my lettuce or my young cabbage plants, no. but I, I do look at them more benevolently. And actually, when I see this, the, the, the slime running across the top of the soil, I think, great, there's <laughs> going into the soil, you know. And I've never actually, I've never found out, I've never, made, it's, it'd be a wonderful project for somebody to do who are studying soil science, is to find out actually what minerals exist in slug slime. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe chromium's in there you never know maybe chromium but one other one that's a real problem uh, and it's another mineral that people forget about and you know obviously it's more difficult to ascertain is iodine that's right yeah yeah because it would have been put down in the fields for the the cows to eat seaweed uh and then as a byproduct of our dairy produce we would have got iodine rich foods um, how, how do we get around that? Or maybe you don't have the answer to that, but you know, first. Well, I do. I do. From our perspective, we don't. We don't have. We're a stockless farm. We don't have animals on our on our fields. So we've been stockless now for what twenty nine years. Brilliant. You know, animals grazing the fields. So um, uh, what I do is we incorporate um, uh, seaweed. We get in organically dried seaweed. And right. You need very small amounts for to, to get the iodine and other trace elements. So we incorporate that into our compost um, and, uh, and it really does make a difference. And, and then I was talking recently to a man down in Murray who's, and I had a trial of his stuff last year. He's producing a, compre a pellet that's compressed from dried chicken, you know, a sterilized chicken manure, organic chicken manure. Mm -hmm. uh, so he sterilizes it and then uh, so that there's no risk of E. coli transference because mm -hmm. that's the big risk of 
chicken manure and we need to do something with it it's really good for the land mm -hmm. and so he's um he's drying it to sterilize it and mixing it with seaweed to come small amounts of seaweed to compress into a, a like a little long sausage which mm -hmm. can be great for pellets and we can spread that on the land and i think that's um that's a great way forward to introduce small amounts of um seaweed to the to the land and I think I can, I, I can, I look forward to, I think actually it's going to happen. We're going to see, um, we're going to see more and more seaweed farming as time goes on. I, I remember when I was a youngster down in my early twenties down in the West of Ireland, uh, I spent a lot of time in Cape, 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 Cape Clear. I had friends living on Cape Clear, so I used to go there because I just loved the place and their farm so much. And there was an old man who, who showed me, you know, where the, Carrageen was at the time of the year when you bake carrageen in the summertime and how to take it out and wash it down and dry it and bleach it uh, mm -hmm. on the grass. And he pointed out to me on the on the shoreline all the, the rows of stones that would have been laid down hundreds of years ago. And the whole, when the tide was out, these stones marked fields, which were actually the seaweed fields. Wow. Seaweed in order to harvest it, to bring it in and put on the land. And, that is fascinating. I didn't realise that you used seaweed. I, I'm really, really impressed that you do because obviously iodine is one of those ones that's often forgotten. And when you say that you think that there's going to be a lot more farms, seaweed farms in, in, in use, do you mean within the organic um, sector or generally within growth of vegetables? I, I think what's I think in, certainly in the organic sector, I don't know about conventional sector, but the conventional sector is doomed anyway. It's not going to continue. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a downward spiral. You know, I would, I, I mean, I, I would be the first to take my hat off to the, to the modern miracle of, of food production and putting it in the supermarkets. And if it worked from the point of view of sustainability, I'd be 100% behind it. The reality is that actually it, where we're heading into a rather downward spiral, it hasn't delivered on soil health. It hasn't delivered on biodiversity and it's, and, and it's not delivering on, on, it's, uh, on quality food because although it might look perfect, it's deficient in minerals. Yes. And, um, and so, you know, adding those three things up and bringing in climate crisis on top of that, you know, we, I think really there's going to be a very big, there, well, there's going to have to be, and I hope there will be in time, um, and it won't be left to the last minute, there will be a shift towards more sustainable, biologically based agricultural systems. And while they might be loads to want to call it organic, you know, they, they'll probably come up with some other name for it, you know, which will be a halfway house or something. Yes. But you would like to think that people will start to pay attention to the need for biology in the soil again, including in, in the bringing in minerals like seaweed and various other uh, things that can be uh, of great beneficial health, both for the soil organisms as well as ultimately for us who eat the food. Exactly. And I was really interested one day, I was down in one of the multiples, multi-supermarkets um, a couple of years ago now, and I went to get carrots. And this particular supermarket, I don't want to mention any names, but this particular supermarket is very limited in its organic produce. So I got ordinary carrots. They had it, the loose carrots had been immersed in fake soil. To make it more aesthetically pleasing, but also to make you feel like you were picking it out of the ground. Like that's been going on for a long time. <laughs> that fascinates me, John. That really fascinates me. How uh, you know? You know they they dye parsnips white <laughs> to make them more whiter. So it's it's actually what more cream, more creamy coloured. Creamy colour. They dye it a creamy colour when they when they're washing. They put a colour into the washing to wash them. And what colour would it have started as? It would be white, but it would be brownie white. They don't want any brown in it. No, 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 definitely not. Um, but it, it just it fascinates me because this is a good few years ago and I just thought I was being totally calmed. You know, I thought, do you honestly think that I think that this is real soil? And even if it was, does that make it any better? Just if you had, but the fact that it was fake soil, I just thought like, you know, they're making the mug of the consumer. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot, an awful lot of things go on that we don't know about, you know, and 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 um, and and I suppose really, I I could 
I could spend a half an hour to telling you about them all, but I actually don't really want to because, you know, the one thing I've learned from the years is my primary interest is, is in promoting organic farming as a positive thing, not knocking conventional farming as something negative, you know. So I don't dwell too much on the negatives of conventional farming. I rather promote organic farming and and also, you know, I, I, there are enough people out there now who want organic food so that it's financially viable. And if farms like mine, who prove to be both um, sustainably viable as well as economically viable, um, are an example to other young people coming along who want to get into agriculture or farmers already who are wanting to change over, then there's um, th that provides the opportunity for, for growth. No, you're, um, just right. you're just right in your, in your attitude towards that because you know, yes, you could bang your head off a brick wall all day trying to figure out why they do things that they do in a conventional method, but focusing on the organic and, and getting it moving forward and, and making it more available for people economically as well, because that is another um, like sticking you know, issue for people when it comes to people think it's massively more expensive when it's not actually massively more expensive at all. No. No, I mean, how many carrots a week can you eat anyway? And carrots, you know, are selling, what, 80, 90 pence a pound, you know? <laughs> uh, you would need, you'd eat a pound of carrots a week, you know? And if you have to pay, say, 20 pence or 30 pence more for organic carrots, you know, it's not exactly a huge amount of money out of your budget every year, you know? And um, also, I mean, a lot of work has been done on eating from fresh produce as well. If you eat produce fresh and cook it yourself, and give up eating processed foods, um, your your budget actually can prove to be, it has proven that your budget actually isn't actually hurt by it, but is actually improved by it. You have more money left over at the end of the week. Um, and, and I think this is something we need to promote, is eating, um, spending a bit of time, more time cooking and eating fresh produce. Exactly, and my favourite vegetable of all is spinach um, and broccoli. Those are my two favourite vegetables. And when I'm looking, um, when I because of my nutrition background, when I'm studying the nutrition in standard spinach in comparison to organic spinach, I think it's literally the, the broadest of all um, nutrient change in the sense of what you're getting from organic spinach in comparison is literally night and day of nutrients and obviously a big scale with regards to all other vegetables organic by far always going to be better for you that's why it's organic because it doesn't need all of those other things in order to make it a aesthetically pleasing and b to sustain its life but when it comes to the the spinach it's number one night and day between the difference nutritionally and i find it quite remarkable you know that that is the case even apples you know the fact that they spray them you know wax them coat them the amount of, of, of chemicals that can be pumped into keeping an apple looking like, like, uh, what is it? Those ones, the granny smiths and things like that really shiny. Golden delicious and that sort of stuff. Apple, yeah. Well, you never see a golden delicious anymore, actually, funny enough. Um, they were actually very delicious if they're grown organically. <laughs> <laughs> Organic golden delicious only. <laughs> and um, we touched a wee bit there on climate change. We were just talking a little bit about that. Um, with the whole COVID-19 situation in place, I don't know if you've noticed, um, obviously the, the amount of import and export that's going on, you know, is... is limited because obviously there's not as many planes in the air and you know th there's a massive change in that and you notice that the, the, the sky is clearer at night do you, do you notice that at the moment oh totally yeah. totally it's it's lovely and also there seems to be an awful lot more bird song this year for some reason and um uh, insect life is starting now it's only like it's been very it's been very dry and sunny in april but it hasn't been warm so it, the, the insect life has emerged, but nothing, nothing quite summery yet, you know, because it is quite cold, funny enough, mm -hmm. if you're out of the sun. So it's, there aren't, the insects really haven't made a big, big appearance yet. They will in the month of May and, and then June especially. Um, but yeah, it's, it, and also the, the, there's no cars on the roads. It's much quieter and more peaceful. Um, there's a lot to be said for it. I mean, in a way, you know, I wouldn't have wished that this was the reason we've no. come 
a, a world that you know where we're putting out less carbon and creating less pollution and and you know we're also all of us are are probably saving a little money because we're not consuming as much anymore yeah. you know we consume the essentials um and and we all need to consume less in order to make a, a to keep our world a more balanced place in terms of being sustainable and the number of people we have have on the planet um uh, and so it's a pity that um you know th this is this is actually giving us um it's giving us a foretaste of what we actually have to do in terms of addressing climate crisis and um and caring for our natural environment and uh, and so you know i i think actually we could learn some lessons from this and i just hope and pray that as this begins to open up we just all don't go back and hit the start buttons again on everything and we end up back to where we were before. It'd be, nice, it'd be nice to think that we could actually learn some lessons and, and maybe move forward a little bit more sustainably. Exactly, and you know, I feel that yes, exactly the same in the sense that it, it's taken a pandemic um, in order for these changes to happen, but nonetheless, you know, the, the silver lining on the cloud, no pun intended, is, is that you know there isn't as much pollution and one iconic thing picture i can think of is the one of delhi you know in the streets of delhi and you can see the mountains in the background and it's just fascinating because they were obviously always there but you just could never see them and i was saying to somebody the other day you know from an environmental uh, point of view say you're an environmentalist or working towards climate change in some way you could only ever fantasize or try to envisage what it would be t potentially like if that wasn't the case but you never thought it would ever be possible to see because cars would never be stripped from the streets planes would never be stripped from the skies and it's through this awful situation that's occurred through the coronavirus but that we actually have been able to see the changes that can actually happen when these things are pulled back and i find that really fascinating exactly it's um as i said it's it's a window to what we have to do in the future. It gives us a, a bit of a glimpse of what is possible. Um, now, how we go forward and rebuild the economy in a way that doesn't entail having to burn an awful lot of fossil fuels um, and, and consume too much is another question. Uh, I, I have no crystal ball how we're going to come out of this, you know, but I suspect we're going to come out of this changed. I don't think it'll. I don't think it'll be the um, the answer to everything. I think, but I think it will give us some direction. And I think, I think we probably will hold on to some of the changes that have have, have occurred as a consequence of this. I'd like to hope we will, and um, and certainly it gives us an insight into what we have to do and what that means. And the 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 answers to all this are there. There are solutions to to how we can go forward in a more sustainable way generate maybe different employment that you know it, it, because some of the employment that's generated isn't viable um, so it's quite a big challenge but I feel um, I feel quite positive I, I've always take a very positive view on life anyway and um, uh, necessity is the mother of invention and um, we're very resilient we're very and we're, we're very capable and I think um, with good leadership we need good leadership with good leadership i think uh, uh, and goodwill i think there's a real chance that um, we'll come through this in a better state overall than than we are now and it's just very tragic that we, there has to be so much suffering in the meantime absolutely um but i think as well one thing that we can take from it is compassion yeah. you know seeing that through community-led incentives and people helping and supporting each other in whichever which way that is, if that's staying at home, that's massive. You know, some people think that if they're not doing anything and they're not helping, well, by not going out and not, you know, interfering with the potential for the spread is doing so much more than people yeah. actually give themselves credit for. And I think that from the from the community aspect of, you know, even just cooking some bread or, or you know, biscuits or you know, giving something to somebody um, in need like that shows that compassion's always been there. So I don't think that this situation has brought about this notion of compassion out of nowhere. I think that the societal demands and pressures that we're under on a daily basis, you know, to 
keep up with everything that's going on all the time. Maybe not so much with yourself because you're saying that, you know, really your situation hasn't changed that much in comparison to many other people whose lives have been turned upside down. But what it shows is, is that people are compassionate by nature, but our ability to show that and express that um, isn't just as uh, prevalent when everyone's so busy. That's right. And then now that we're not, it's not that we're not busy, it's just that we're, I think our priorities are changing. We're getting more time to reflect. We're having to really face things head on because obviously this is a much bigger than, this, this situation is much bigger than any of us. That the compassion and the acknowledgement for the importance of, you know, caring for others and, um, and your own is, is very, very uh, prevalent at the moment. And I think that that's something that, you know, can be taken from this is that um, our priorities, it really gets your priorities in place. I also think the other big thing that's changing is that our, our, um, uh, uh, our attitudes of respect for people are changing. I feel like, you know, suddenly we have a whole new set of, of heroes, you know, um, where, you know, this thing knows no boundaries and so borders and wealth don't exclude you from coronavirus, you know? And, uh, and I, I sort of think to myself really that, you know, um, the, the new celebrities, okay? <laughs> our, our healthcare services people who were there up in the front line, you know? And I begin to think, you know, I, st I know I'm personally, I, I, um, they're, for me, they're heroes. When I see somebody dressed in, uh, uh, in, in, in a, in a, in a uniform, an NHS uniform, I want to say, I want to shake my hand and say, great, well done, good for you. <laughs> I know, I know, because it is, it is so difficult. And Congratulate the them for their courage and their fearlessness and their dedication. And it's the same for bus drivers and, and you know, people who clean the toilets. They become so important. They're the most important person in the building is the person who cleans the toilets, I you know? know. And I they should be, they're our unsung heroes and we should be singing about them. And we should be recognizing how valuable the work that they do is. And we should be, we should not be always undervaluing their work, both economically and otherwise. We now need to start, I really, really hope what comes out of this is we start to value the work of the people who are doing the really important things, like the nursing, the cleaning of the toilets, the, the, the bus conductors on our, on our on train conductors who put their lives on the line every day in order that we can get around to do what we have to do. This is what's really important, I think, uh, respect. I think it's time we, 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 we revisited the, the, and gave respect to the people who deserve it, really deserve it. Exactly. Well, it's a, it's a really, really good point, John, for sure. And um, I also feel that uh, it's important to mention that, you know, you've got, you've got busier almost from, from this, this whole experience because people need to eat. I know, um, I, know. I know. I'm supposed to be retiring, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And I've, I've yeah. never been working so hard in my life as over the last couple of months, you know, yeah. because so many people have come to us asking for vegetables. And so we're, we're, we've, we've taken on, we've nearly doubled the size in terms, that's all. I have a waiting list that I can't, I have no hope of actually getting to the bottom of because I don't have enough land and can, can't grow enough vegetables. So, um, but it's certainly not in one year anyway, because it takes planning, you know, so. Yeah. But um, we've grown considerably, and I, I luckily I'm now at full capacity. I every square inch has been cultivated and will be put under um, put under growing vegetables this year that can be, um, uh, while trying to maintain the sustainability of it. And I've taken on you know quite a few new employees, and uh, so it's yeah we, we've um, yeah it's 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 one of the um, it's one of the consequences of this. I'm not sure actually from a personal perspective of what I wanted. You know, I actually wanted to, to reduce my business and get smaller and retire a little bit, but it's not, uh, that's not what's being asked of me. Okay, at the moment. okay so just to round up, um, just to finish, thanks so much. I know you've been very, very busy um, and taking the time out to have a chat with me on the podcast has been really beneficial. And I'm sure a lot of people who are listening and watching will take a lot from what it is that you have to say, John. So I really appreciate your time. and. Just before we go, what's the one thing that you're looking forward to most about things resuming to some form of normality? Um, I, not having to socially distance myself from people. 
especially my grandchildren yeah. <laughs> and my children. I really, you know, I find I so much look forward to, you know, that nobody can come and visit us and it, it, Zooming and FaceTiming just isn't the same. You know, we, I really look forward to actually the, the social distancing coming to an end. Yeah, exactly. Just like so many other people. Well, I think that you've got a great ethos and a great mindset when it comes to growing vegetables and the importance of eating well and eating organic. So just thank you again. If anyone wants to find out any information about Helens Bay, what's the email address? It's info at helensbayorganic.com. Okay, so that's the email. And the website is just helensbayorganic.com. That's it. Okay. Thanks very much for taking the time again, John, and take care. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Sal. And you, you be safe now. Bye-bye.